that didn't work. This hearing will now come to order. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's Research and Science Education Subcommittee hearing on the Science of Science and Innovation Policy, also known as SCICIP. For those of you who may not be familiar with the phrase, the science of science policy is a field of in interdisciplinary research that focuses on understanding how our policy decisions impact innovation and science in engineering research. Given the magnitude of the federal investment in science and technology, there is a need for objective analysis and evaluation of federally funded R&D programs. And given the size of the budget deficit, Congressional decision makers need the best information possible to make sure we are spending taxpayer dollars optimally. Today, we'll be hearing from a diverse panel of witnesses about the current state of research and education in this emerging field. This topic is of particular interest to me since it goes to the core of why I joined the Science and Technology Committee when I first came to Congress. Like most members of this committee, I believe that science and engineering research and education have driven long-term economic growth and improved the quality of life for all Americans. I view science and innovation policy as critical for maintaining our international competitiveness and creating jobs. But the best policies are not self-evident. As someone who was trained as an engineer and a social scientist, I believe we need data and proper analysis of this data to be able to determine as best we can, the optimal policy. We are going to hear today about some of the research that is being done on science policy. I'm eager to hear the panel's thoughts on what is being found, how well these findings are being disseminated, and whether research in this area is actually helping policymakers. While many of us would agree that science has had a positive impact on our lives, I think we know very little about how the process of innovation works. What kinds of research programs or institutional structures are most effective? How do investments in R&D translate to more jobs, improved health, and overall societal well-being? How should we balance investments in basic and applied research? With millions of Americans out of work, it becomes more critical than ever that we find answers to these questions. We'll also take a closer look at the state of education in science and technology policy and how these degree programs and courses of study are contributing by educating the next generation of researchers and science policy practitioners. There are a variety of science and technology policy programs that are popping up across the country. They can be found in public policy schools, economics departments, business schools, and other places, even philosophy departments. I'm looking forward to hearing more about these programs, including what kind of students they attract and where those students go upon graduation. Finally, I hope to hear recommendations from today's witnesses about how the federal government, particularly the National Science Foundation, can foster interdisciplinary research in this area and how it can contribute to improved education and training for students who want to pursue a career at the intersection of science, technology, and public policy. I thank the witnesses for being here this afternoon, especially as we've had to uh, move this, uh, this hearing back from, from the morning, and I look forward to your testimony. Now, be, before I uh, uh, recognize Dr. Ehlers, uh, I, this will likely be the last uh, hearing of this subcommittee, last meeting of the subcommittee. It may not be, but uh, just in case it is the last for this Congress, I wanted to um, uh, say that uh, I think we should all recognize Dr. Ehlers for his contributions in, uh, in Congress and especially on, on this committee through the years. Uh, it has uh, been certainly a, uh, uh, I've had a great partner working on this uh, as I've chaired the subcommittee uh, for the last two years. Uh, he is someone who really truly is dedicated to the issues that uh, we are facing here and we deal with here in the committee. Uh, too many things right now, I think, are becoming uh, uh, partisan footballs 
And uh, Dr. Ehlers really has uh, kept his eye on what is best in trying to find what is best for for our country. And I, I want to thank you for uh, for the years that you have put in here, and uh, wish you the best um, in uh, in your, your your next endeavors. But it's been a pleasure to. Uh, to work with you, especially over these, these last few years. And uh, with that, I will now recognize Dr. Ehlers for an opening statement. Well, thank you for those kind words, Mr. Chairman. I think my biggest challenge will be learning how to sleep in. <laughs> but uh, I very much appreciate those comments. I, I've always just tried to do a good job wherever I am. It's a trade I learned from my parents and uh, never, 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 ever expected to be in the Congress or in politics. And my mother never quite got over it. But I, as she put it, what are you doing with all those nasty people? Uh, but uh, but turns out my colleagues here are not nasty people. And I appreciate your leadership on this uh, subcommittee Dan, and you've done a great job of leading us in the right direction, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Your opening statement. With that, I will proceed to the opening statement. Today, we will explore the current state of science and technology policy research and the role it plays in informing our policy decisions. And I have to put insert a little comment in here. And that is when I first arrived here and was assigned to the Science Committee, which made obvious sense, since uh, I was at that time, I think, one of the very few, if the, if the only scientists in the Congress, at least on the Republican side. And uh, the first meeting of the Science Committee, I asked the chair, how many scientists do you have on staff? And the answer was none. And I said, really? How can you function without me? He said, well, we don't really need people to understand science. We need people who understand science policy. Well, as a scientist, I had never thought much about science policy. And little did I know that in a conversation with Newt Gingrich where I commented that I thought it a bit strange that the science policy we were operating under in, in the government and in the Congress was Van Iver Bush's 1945 book. And I said, that's a little out of date. Things change rapidly in, in science. It's a great book, The Endless Frontier. Uh, and Van Bush was a, a great man. He'd done a, a lot of good work, especially during World War II. But I talked to Newt Gingrich about that, that that was the latest uh, science policy book that the, was guiding the government. So he did, as Newt Gingrich always did, said, hey, it is time we get another one. Why don't you do it? So I learned after a couple of years never to suggest anything to do it because he always dumped a burden on me. Uh, but in any event, I did uh, proceed to work on a book uh, which just walked in the door <laughs> with my aid. And some of you have seen it already. It's called Unlocking Our Future. Now, this is not a great science policy book. I, I knew absolutely nothing about science policy when we proceed to write it, but it seemed to me there are certain things that were obvious and we put them in here. And I deliberately said unlocking our future uh, because I felt we had so much to do and I wasn't able to do it in this thin little volume. Um, it did get uh, some notice and it inspired some science policy individuals to engage more seriously in this, and some of them, many of them are represented here. Uh, but it was a, a real education to me. It's, uh, you should try that sometime, writing a book about something you know num nothing about. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to learn. And fortunately, uh, I had 
as a child, I was homeschooled uh, because of illness. And so all the learning I did was things that I learned and learned on my own. So that was good preparation for this. Uh, we, we clearly badly need something like this again. And uh, it's one case where the author is delighted to say, uh, this is too old now, it's time to get busy. Someone else better start writing a better thing. Let me uh, continue with my opening sp statement. When Dr. John Marlborough, Marburger, rather, who was science advisor to President Bush, called for the establishment of a science of science policy, in 2005, we embarked on a new journey into this emerging field of interdisciplinary research by establishing an interagency working group. The Science of Science and Innovation Policy uh, program at the National Science Foundation. The shorthand for it was SICEP. And uh, most recently, the Science and Technology for America, America's Reinvestment which is the emphasis that I and others, uh, including the authors of The Gathering Storm, have been emphasizing. Because it's important for us to measure the effect of research on innovation, competitiveness, and science, which has come to be called star metrics. I hope this hearing will provide us with a detailed measurement of how far we have come on that journey, as well as an encouraging picture of the progress we have made. I have spent many years on this committee working to strengthen U.S. innovation and science education, and I have been a longtime advocate of increased federal funding for basic research. I wish the entire Congress were as receptive to that notion as the audience in front of us today is. But this funding produces the technological innovations that will keep America competitive in the global market and it is essential for us to educate American workers in the skills needed for 21st century jobs. As with any program, sustained congressional oversight is required to ensure that the science of science policy programs are effective and that they progress in a timely and fiscally responsible manner. I am encouraged by efforts which seek, seek to maximize our current investments in scientific research. And I am very, <coughs> I believe it is very important that those R&D investments provide us with measurable returns. And that is why I've worked so hard to try and make the research and development tax credit permanent, because that's one good way to encourage industry to, uh, to work on these issues. We must be mindful of that fact as Congress deliberates the best ways to use American taxpayer funds in this difficult economic climate. To that end, I'm very interested in learning more about the progress and potential of the Star Metrics program and its recently completed pilot project. I hope <coughs> I look forward to learning more about the status of science affecting science policy and the advancements which have been made since, since 2005. And I want to thank our panel of witnesses for being here today for accommodating our last second scheduling change, and I look forward to, forward to hearing their insights on this topic. There's much work to be done uh, to help our nation recover its lead in technological development and in manufacturing and in science in general. And so uh, I'm looking forward to the testimony today, and I hope you can enlighten us and out of, out of this will come, first of all, a new version of this, and secondly, uh, as some improvement in our judgments about science and also science education in this nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers. Maybe we can make that a bestseller now. <laughs> now, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, their statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I want to introduce our witnesses. Uh, Dr. Julia Lane is the Program Director of the Science of Science and Innovation Policy Program at the National Science Foundation. Dr. Daniel Sarowitz is the Co-Director of the Consortium for Science, Policy, and Outcomes and Professor of Science and Society at Arizona State University. 
Dr. Fiona Murray is an Associate Professor of Management in the Technological Innovation and Entrepreneur Group at MIT Sloan School of Management. And Dr. Albert H. Tight is the Director of Science and Policy Programs at the American Association for the Advancements of Science. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. And before we begin, I just want to mention that we will be uh, having votes coming up soon. Uh, so uh, probably one of the most important things if everyone can through which investments in science and engineering work their way through the outcomes that we've mentioned. It funds researchers from a wide range of disciplines, and it funds students to study science policy issues in a scientific manner. As you also know, it supports the redesign of surveys undertaken by the National Science Foundation Science Resource Statistics, the statistical agency charged with uh, describing the science and in innovation enterprise. For example, the new business research R&D and innovation survey, the Birdies survey, has been completely redesigned from a 1950s uh, structure to something that captures the new R&D innovation um, activities. So it's not just the academic community that's advancing the science of science policy. It's also policymakers and the executive and legislative branches who recognize that we need these better approaches. That's why the National Science and Technology Committee established the Science of Science Policy Interagency Task Group. That task group, the science policy agencies that are represented on that, created a roadmap. And that characterized our current system of uh, measuring the science and engineering enterprise as inadequate. We can do better. There is enormous potential to do better. The first step to doing better is to get better data. Just as good bricks need straw, good research in an empirical field, like science and innovation policy, requires good data. So to that end, the CISIP program and the Science of Science Policy Interagency Group initiated the development of the STAR Metrics program, to which you've already alluded. The benefits of this program 
is that rather than having balkanized data sets that different agencies and different institutions use to answer the types of questions that the American people are asking, we can develop a common bottom-up empirical infrastructure that will be available to all recipients of federal funding and to science agencies to quickly respond to state, congressional, and OMB requests. It's critical that we take a bottom-up effort in order to uh, <coughs> develop these approaches, one that's domain-specific, generalizable, and replicable. Phase one started in, in um, March, jointly sponsored by NIH, the lead agency, NSF, and OSTP, and that's collecting the data required to, with low burden, respond to questions about the jobs associated with science funding. Phase two, which is trying to collect broader data on a wide range of outcomes, not just jobs, but social, scientific, economic, and workforce outcomes, is beginning this fall with formal consultations with research institutions. Furthermore, science is fundamentally an international endeavor. We've engaged with the European Union, with the Japanese, with the Brazilians, with many uh, countries in order to document the impact of uh, science investments. In fact, the Japanese government has recently set aside funding for a Japanese equivalent of a CISIP program. The European Union has also shown considerable interest in what we've been up to and is considering emulating the bottom-up, low-burden endeavor that the CISIP, the Science of Science Policy, and the Star Metrics Program has pushed forward to. And the Brazilian government has also requested briefings on the CISIP, Science of Science Policy, and Star Metrics Program. This concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to answering any questions you or the members of the committee might have. Thank you, Dr. Lane. Uh, Dr. Sarowitz. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lipinski and Ranking Member Ehrlich. I very much appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to testify. So my name is Daniel Sarowitz. I'm a professor of science and society at Arizona State University, where I co-direct the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, which works to understand and improve the linkages between science and technology and social outcomes. We're located on ASU's Tempe campus, we also have a location here in D.C. We're a highly interdisciplinary and collaborative organization involving researchers at dozens of other institutions. We're also fortunate to receive generous grant funding from NSF, including from the Science of Science and Innovation Policy Program, so I declare my vested interest in the outcomes of this hearing. I'd like to make three brief points in support of my uh, overextensive written testimony. The first is about the importance of the CICIP program itself. Uh, with shrinking discretionary budgets, vibrant economic competitors and daunting challenges to our well-being, the nation needs effective tools for making better decisions about how to design, assess, and set priorities for our science and innovation enterprise. For the most part, we lack these tools, as we've already heard. As former presidential science advisor Jack Marburger said in 2005, the nascent field of social science of science policy needs to grow up and quickly. With modest resources, SICIP is mobilizing a community of researchers to focus on the complex problem of how to wring the most out of our public investment in R&D. SICIP reacted quickly to support research assessing the impacts of stimulus funding for R&D and is beginning with NIH to take on the incredibly complex problem of evaluating what the nation gets for its enormous investment in biomedical R&D. These are really difficult challenges and it's hard to see how this committee and others at the helm of the R&D enterprise can guide it effectively in the absence of such efforts. My second point is that outputs are not outcomes, and SICIP needs to focus on outcomes. Outputs are immediate products of R&D, like publications and patents and PhDs. Outcomes are what people care about, not just economic growth, but of course economic growth, but also secure and affordable food supplies and energy supplies, high quality public health, a clean environment, expanding job opportunities, and strong national defense. The 40-year 40, 40 war on cancer has yielded the output of remarkable new scientific knowledge, yet very modest gains in public health outcomes, despite the tens of billions spent. 30 years of energy R&D output has done little to advance the outcome of reducing our vulnerability to energy-based threats to security, economy, and environment. Research on science and innovation policy to date has given us a pretty good idea how to design and assess science policies to enhance outputs, but we still have a lot to learn about how to implement and assess successful outcome-based 
science and innovation policies. My final point is that research on outcomes-based science and innovation policies and the use of such research by decision makers are not separate problems. While the SISIP program is commendably serious about disseminating its research, its results to policymakers, the dissemination problem is also structural. That is, it's built into the way we organize much research, including SISIP. NSF's great strength in supporting bottom-up inquiry on fundamental problems is also a weakness when there's an urgent need for new knowledge, the need that Dr. Marburger pointed out. Such cases require close ties between those who do research and decision makers who might use research results. And we already heard from Julia Lane some of her efforts to create those ties. Now, on the one hand, these ties allow researchers to understand the needs of decision makers and to recognize the types of information that will be both usable and used. But at the same time, close ties allow decision makers to understand what research can and cannot do for them. Such mutual understanding breeds trust and value and usable science. There are many examples of federal programs that link research performance and research use, including USDA's Agricultural Extension Service, the USGS Earthquake Hazards Program, NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program. Similarly, DARPA is justifiably well regarded for its capacity to connect the technology needs of DOD to research groups in academia and the private sector. These and other examples are discussed in the uh, handbook Usable Science, which I just happen to have brought along with me, which summarizes the results of CSPO's five-year NSF-funded decision-making under uncertainty project carried out jointly with researchers at the University of Colorado. These lessons can be applied to SISIP. Let me mention three possibilities. First, NSF could sponsor one or more large centers for SISIP research, education, and outreach with a core requirement to build strong, ongoing collaborations between researchers and science policy decision makers. Second, NSF could work with mission-oriented R&D agencies to integrate SISIP activities into a range of existing outcome-oriented programs. Third, NSF could require all of its center-scale awardees, such as science and technology centers and engineering research centers, to be designed from the outset to include integrated SISIP components. Through these sorts of approaches, SISIP could enhance its capacity to produce usable knowledge for the near to medium term and help accelerate a convergence between science and innovation policy research and policy decisions across a range of R&D outcome priorities. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to discussing these issues more. Thank you, Dr. Sarowitz. I think that's the beginning of both, but we should be able to get the uh, testimony in here. Uh, Dr. Murray. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Lipinski um, and other members of the subcommittee for the opportunity for being here. My name is Fiona Murray. As you heard before, I'm a professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School and I'm also Associate Director of the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, to start my remarks, I thought I'd just describe the perspective I bring. Uh, briefly, I am the grateful recipient of two SISIP grants. Um, I've worked on the what I would think of as a SISIP-oriented agen research agenda for more than a decade, although I really only discovered the SISIP research community in about 2006. Um, as a faculty member at a business school, I also engage on these issues with managers, scientists themselves, who are also interested in a sense of the lower levels of how to organize effectively uh, to ensure the productivity and impact of their research. I should also just say something about my own training. Um, I have a background of bachelor's, master's, and PhD in chemistry. Um, that's a very unusual training for somebody who does SISIP. Uh, I think it enables me to bring a unique understanding of the, the bench science uh, to this research, although as I do note in my written uh, remarks, I'm not sure that this is an ideal path to learn the rigorous social science methods that one really needs. I've had to rely on, again, self-education and some very patient co-authors to get me over what I think is a quite high bar uh, to make a serious contribution to this endeavor, and in particular to do it in a way that contributes to the policy and the scholarly debate. Uh, I want to just take my time to see if I can make three points. I'll make two if time if only time permits. Um, something about the vision of SISIP and what I think that means about the kinds of gaps there are in the research, and then also how I think the SISIP community might more effectively be organized to really have an impact in terms of research uh, links to the community and in particular education. So I think that SISIP is not simply about doing science and technology analysis. I think there's already an excellent scholarship describing policy initiatives, the government attitude towards science, and the politics of science and innovation policy. What I think that SISIP brings, which is unique, is this sort of scientific lens to the problem. And what I mean by that is that it's a serious and I think important attempt to undertake causal analysis and evidence-based analysis, asking whether and how particular policy interventions actually have an impact 
both in the short run and the long run. And so I think that good scientific research defines impact richly. It's about the level and the rate and the direction of scientific progress and innovation, but it's also about long-run impact on economic growth. But I also want to emphasize this causal piece of what kinds of policies we think make a difference. I think that at its best, SICIP defines policy broadly but precisely in particular research instances. And so it can mean everything from high-level national policies, uh, laws, but also agency implementation processes, agency selection processes. But below that, community behaviors, things like the Bermuda Rules and so on, and even at a more micro level, lab level choices around how we choose and to organize scientific research at the ground level. I think a key approach to SICIP has been grounded in two recent developments. One is the data developments that have already been discussed, but I would also say have been enabled actually by a massive scientific data infrastructure investment. So in some of my own work has really been enabled by investments in things like GenBank and one's ability to interrogate genetic data to then do science policy analyses. But also I think a second piece is social science methods in program evaluation. I'm sure you're familiar with this from the work that you do on uh, evaluating education policy, but I think that uh, the ability to use experiments and causal analysis and so on from that policy evaluation uh, toolkit is extremely important to pushing uh, SICIP forward. So I think that SICIP has really been critical and attracted serious scholars, but in my view there are still some gaps. Um, to pick on them, the straw and bricks analogy, it strikes me that while we need bricks, if we want to cross the bridge from data to understanding, we actually have to build a bridge with those bricks. And what does that mean? I think that does mean more analysis as well as just measurement. I think at the moment, uh, a lot of the SICIP work, including my own, is tremendously focused on biologists and, and our funding on the National Institutes of Health. That's critical, but not the only arena. And I think that there's, we do need to understand how other disciplines and other agencies are working. I think that there's been a focus on national level rules um, and, ag and specific agencies and less on these community level choices about how to organize structure collaborations and more informal efforts. Um, I think we also need to focus on distributional issues. So not just how many more papers are produced, but what kind, are they breakthrough, are they everyday science, what kinds of researchers, are they American or foreign and so on. I don't think we focus enough on that. And let me turn uh, in the last few seconds to saying something about the SICIP community. I think that the community actually needs to do more of its own bottoms up uh, organizing. Uh, the NSF has done a tremendous job in kind of structuring it in a top down way, but that's a huge amount of work for one agency to do. And I think as a community, we need to do a more bottom up uh, in order to both engage in more knowledge exchange among ourselves um, to focus on education. And I think the educational imperative at the PhD level does need to be organized uh, across a number of campuses. And then I think at the policy level and our links to policymakers again, have to be organized in a more uh, community-based way. So I would suggest that that needs to be done through a consortium of universities, uh, but with this tripartite mission of research, education, and then links uh, to policy. And I'll leave my remarks there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Dr. Teich. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lipinski, and Ranking Member Ehlers, other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at this hearing today. I'm Al Tyke, and I am a Director of Science and Policy Programs at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, although, uh, as you know, AAAS and I uh, myself have been deeply involved in science and innovation policy for many years. Uh, although this has been an active field of research at least since the 1960s and has produced a large body of uh, literature and a substantial number of researchers, there's a feeling that the results of this work uh, are not widely known or used among those who actually make science and innovation policy. This was behind the frustration of Dr. Marburger in his speech, which led to the establishment of the NSF SISIP program. The SICIP program has a unique mandate to couple advances in fundamental knowledge about processes of scientific discovery and technological innovation with issues of relevance to policymakers. Among the features that differentiate the SICIP program from its predecessors are the fact that it is not just supporting individual research grants, but it is attempting to build a community of practice among researchers and to connect that community with potential users of the research, practitioners in the federal government. AAAS has played an active role in building this community of practice through a workshop in 2009 that brought researchers together to learn from one another. 
In that workshop, we saw how SISIP researchers reflect distinct disciplinary traditions that can inhibit a pro productive interdisciplinary dialogue. Uh, even in this not very large field, they can't always talk to one another. They may ask different questions, use different theoretical frameworks, and employ different methodologies, even when they may address seemingly similar topics. At the same time, because of the academic reward system, SISIP researchers, like many other researchers, seldom speak in terms that policymakers find directly useful. As one speaker said at the 2009 AAAS workshop, Policymakers are confronted with a babel of, le of tongues, which leads them to ignore the experts and turn to other sources of information and advice. Next month, AAAS will convene another workshop with NSF support. That one will try to connect researchers with customers in the government. We hope that that workshop will serve to allow the two communities to better understand each other's needs and expectations. While projects like the AAAS and SF SISIP workshops are an important step in building a community of practice, there's more that can be done. Here are a couple of ideas just as food for thought. Regarding research, researchers tend to communicate directly with their peers via journals and, and uh, conference presentations in order to gain recognition in their fields. Uh, but few policymakers read those journals or attend those conferences. We need to find ways to encourage SISIP researchers to communicate with policymakers either directly or through the media and to be rewarded and not penalized by less policy oriented peers in their fields for doing so. On the teaching side, although many of the university programs that provide graduate training in science and innovation policy are interdisciplinary, the training they provide is not always responsive to the needs and priorities of policymakers. It might be useful to strengthen ties between researchers and policymakers by engaging policymakers in helping to develop and review curricula, as well as engaging them in teaching and as adjuncts or guest lecturers. Some schools already do this. Others would do well to follow their lead. And beyond education, there's another mechanism for promoting greater mutual understanding between researchers and policymakers, it's people transfer. One approach might be to create a program to give SISIP researchers the opportunity to work in government for perhaps a year. Providing SISIP researchers an opportunity to work in a policymaking setting for a while, as we do for scientists and engineers in our Congressional Fellows Program, would allow them to gain firsthand knowledge regarding the needs, priorities, and modes of operation of the potential users of their work. Like our workshops, this hearing is an opportunity for, science po for the science policy community to hear from you as policymakers what research questions you believe SISIP sci researchers should be addressing. I look forward to the Q&A as an opportunity to exchange ideas on that subject. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Tyke. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start questions if, uh, if if you want to leave to get over to votes, uh, I think we have about four minutes left, probably in the in the first vote. But um, I think this vote's going to last a long time. Uh, but then we will, if it, if the witnesses can come back a afterwards, it's probably going to be about an hour, though. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you uh, have uh, uh, will we'll have to leave at at, at that point. But um, with Dr. Ehlers, yes. Uh, you have a suggestion? No, uh, just a quick comment, uh, which uh, shows the importance of this topic and why we should come back if we can, depending on the votes. Uh, but uh, I would simply observe that the current process in the Congress is that science policy is set by the appropriations subcommittees. The money controls everything. And when they decide to give a certain amount of money to a certain project, uh, that's basically ends up being the decision. That totally ignores the input of uh, other scientists and SICIP folks who uh, have a much greater interest. So something you can think about in the meantime is how that could be addressed uh, without throwing out the Appropriations Committee entirely. 
which uh, is probably impossible. So I just wanted to mention that, and uh, I, uh, I hope you'll have some brilliant ideas on how we could practically address that, that particular problem. Uh, my staff just informed me 300 people have not yet voted, uh, so we can probably walk over instead of running over. But uh, I hope the votes don't go on too long. And I'd be delighted if any of you would take on the challenge uh, to follow this. Let me, one, one quick last comment. Uh, when Newt Gingrich was here, he wanted to double the funding of NIH, which did happen in the Appropriations Committee. I argued that we should have equal funding increase for NSF. Uh, treat, treat all the sciences equally. I, he said, we'll do that one next. Well, unfortunately, we lost the majority and so the next time never happened. But today I've heard Newton say in numerous speeches, the one big mistake he regrets is not having increased NSF and the other hard sciences at the same time we increased NIH. So let that be a, a moral, moral uh, note for all of you who hope someday to be a, the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you can s make sure you spread that word amongst your uh, your, your colleagues uh, before before you uh, before you leave, so yeah. uh, can uh, help us who who really want to make sure we get that done, get that uh, done in uh, in the future. Uh, well, you now have your homework assignment. We will have probably about an hour, uh, and we will be back hopefully sooner than that, but it's going to be at least 45 minutes, I'd say, and uh, look forward to uh, hearing your, your answers. I'm, I, I'm most interested in um, how we really make these connections. Dr. Tyke, I uh, appreciate some of your, your, your comments. I'd just like to delve maybe some more into how we can, uh, having been a, you know, as a political scientist, um, and uh, talk about not, you know, Policymakers don't read the journals. Political scientists weren't reading the journals because it didn't really speak to them, much less the policymakers. Um, but uh, I'd like to delve into that uh, also some more how we can improve that. But uh, with that uh, the committee subcommittee will be in recess. hearing back in. I will now start the questioning. I understand Dr. Sarowitz has to leave at uh, 4 o'clock, so um, we will uh, we each, uh, each of us will get a chance to uh, ask some questions before you have to leave. Uh, so I will now recognize myself for five minutes and we'll begin with Dr. Sarowitz. Um, you mentioned your testimony that most of the data available for uh, size-tip analysis are input-output data, level of funding, number of graduate students, patents, et cetera, publications, uh, and that these data offer an incomplete view of the societal value of S&T investments. So what would you suggest uh, that we do to better characterize and measure the social outcomes of, uh, of R&D? Okay, thanks for asking that. It, it actually, um, See how should I put this? It uh, uh, my answer will reflect a diversity in pers in perspectives um, here. Uh, I think we can we can all agree that the process and Julia actually wrote about this wonderfully in Science Magazine that the process that leads from R and D to a particular desired social outcome, for example, more employment or better health, is extremely complex with many um, with many uh, different uh, inputs into the into the process. Um, so, but I think that um, measuring is one way to understand things, but also very close um, uh, case-based contextual analysis is another way to under understand things. And uh, my view is that the system is so complex 
uh, that we're probably not going to come up with a big theory of how you can uh, predict social outcomes from science and technology inputs. But we are going to be able to develop uh, a number of principles uh, that reflect our understanding of particular uh, examples. So I think uh, the kind of data that, and I wrote about this a little bit in my testimony, that we really need, uh, a kind of data that we're lacking that will be very important is very um, granular case studies of both successes and failures in, in the, the full range of linkages from laboratory uh, to social outcomes for a particular uh, range of, um, of uh, scientific priorities. And I think by doing that, we'll be able to elicit a set of general guiding principles that can help you guys um, distinguish between uh, policy decisions that make sense and policy decisions that don't make sense. I guess I'm a little skeptical of the idea that we'll ever be able to, to actually predict with precision. Um, but I think we can be a lot smarter about the basic set of assumptions if we can develop uh, some really close case studies, sort of end-to-end -end case studies uh, that show uh, in great detail. Let me just, qu just quickly say, one, we're looking, for example, at, at, at Arizona State, we're looking um, at the development of s the solar power industry in Arizona, because obviously we have a lot of sun there. Um, and so it's not, one of the important inputs, of course, is uh, R&D into the solar power industry, but there's all sorts of local dynamics from water availability, land use, obviously regulatory frameworks, all of those things are important, and they're not generalizable. Um, so while I think we can develop a very rich case study around uh, solar in Arizona, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think we should necessarily worry about a grand theory. Um, so we should develop uh, best practice case studies looking very closely uh, at, the, at, at the full process of leading from the R&D uh, activities themselves to the societal outcomes. Does anyone else want to, any of the witnesses want to comment on that? Have any, Anything to add to that? If, uh, if not, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think about this in, in your uh, answer, Dr. Serowitz, and I think, uh, do we have, do we have the data available right now, or do we need to do a better job of collecting data so that we can uh, do this kind of, kind of research? Uh, it, the, the whole generalizability of, of this is, uh, well, when you look at almost uh, anything that's really a social uh, process, uh, you know, I always go back to my days as a political scientist in, in trying to uh, put together these theories that, that will predict uh, outcomes and the, the struggle with, with doing that and trying to make political science into uh, physics. Uh, how much can we do here when we're talking about um, you know, doing the SISIP uh, research and what, what we can really glean from uh, the data that we have. So, so let me just say there's a diversity of perspectives here, and that's good. I mean, I think it's a rich field, and it needs to bring lots of perspectives uh, together from the highly quant quantitative model oriented to the more case-based uh, qual qualitative. We need all that. I think we know a lot. Um, I think uh, Dr. Tyke's point about uh, the problems of communicating what we know is really important. Um, and that uh, th thinking about how, so ha how to communicate more effectively the things that we already know for your benefit is, uh, is an essential part of it. And so you know, two things need to go on simultaneously. You know, they're, they're, th this field is really only just begin beginning to kind of get its legs. Dr. Murray talked about how she's been doing it for a long time, didn't know there was a field out there. I've been doing it for a, a, a long time as well, but more or less in small groups. So, so Dr. Lane's you know, efforts to create a community it does two things. One is it, creates, it does create the intellectual momentum that we're going to need to, to, to move the field forward. But it also allows us to, to, to really um, uh, collect what we know and pr already, which I think is considerable, and present that if we can figure out how to communicate uh, effectively. And I would be glad to talk about that a little bit too if you'd like. Well, let's, sure. let's come back. I, right now I'm going to... Um yield back my time. I assume my time is up, and uh, I, I want to yield now to uh, recognize Dr. Ehlers for, for five minutes. Thank you very much, and uh, I don't have any questions for you, Dr. Saravitz, other than to um, note that we produce weather today that's very close to what you have back home. We did put a little moisture in the air as well, so that's a little different. I wouldn't be dressed like this either. So. <laughs> that's true. 
I uh, appreciate you coming. I don't have any questions for you that have not been either answered or explained already. Uh, what I would like to ask is on the two ends of the panel, Dr. Lane and Dr. Tyke, uh, you're both quite familiar with the Congress and how it operates. Uh, do you have any suggestions on what, on what someone in the Congress could do to help educate our members about the importance of science policy and what it should, what it should be, what it can do, what it cannot do, and uh, any any wisdom you could give us. I think it would be very helpful as we go forward on the Science Committee and, and try to, uh, I hate to use the word modernize, but you know what I'm talking about, just try to get the workings of the House of Representatives and the Senate to reflect reality and what should be done about the science of science policy, and in particular, what role science policy should have in guiding the Congress on the very difficult issues we have, particularly those relating to funding. So we'll start with you, Dr. Lane, and go to Dr. Tyke, and also Dr. Murray, if you have any comments on that. Well, thank you very much for that thoughtful question. Uh, I uh, am not as wise in the ways of Congress as you, obviously, so this is um, very much in the uh, spirit of a suggestion rather than um, a de Regist approach. One of the things that I think is most important that will get um, Congress to understand the value of science investments is evidence. Uh, if there is clear evidence of the impact of science investments on the four sets of dimensions, social, scientific, economic and workforce that uh, both has a qualitative aspect, that is that there are real people affected uh, and there are real uh, advances that are made in the quality of life, but also quantitative, that is where you can unambiguously say there were uh, this amount of uh, investment led to a whole variety of different sets of outcomes and that, uh, that tracer is is clear. I think that's what gets people atten in Congress attention because obviously they're serving the American taxpayer and that's what the American taxpayer is interested in finding out. Okay, and Dr. Teich? Yeah, I, I think I would turn that around a bit uh, and uh, uh, point out that it's really uh, very much up to us in the uh, in the SISIP and science science policy communities to communicate effectively with you in the Congress. You have so many messages coming at you from so many different directions that somehow uh, what we need to do is to differentiate the kinds of uh, information that we have, hopefully evidence-based, uh, and um, uh, recog recognizing, uh, we have to recognize that it is not the only influence and the, the only thing that you have to take into account in making decisions. The decisions, uh, I, I was struck by uh, something uh, uh, Chairman Lipinski said about making uh, political science into physics. I started out, I got an undergraduate degree in physics and my PhD in, in political science. And, you know, phys in some respects, physics is a lot easier. You know, you, you, you start, you, you can, my fr freshman physics, you know, assume a frictionless plane. Okay, well, you can assume a frictionless plane, and it works in some respects. Assume a frictionless Congress, and you know, you got nothing. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. So there is a. Uh, it's it, politics isn't neat. It's it's not. Uh, uh, it, and, and data doesn't always trump a lot of other factors that go into decisions. We have to understand that we have to communicate within that framework and uh, uh, and then I think it is up to you uh, in the policy community to uh, uh, to make use of that well, best I could do on short notice. If we had a frictionless Congress uh, hmm? things might go better. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Murray, you have any wisdom to add to this? 
Well, I'm not sure it's wisdom. It's certainly a, a, a thought I have is that I think it's important to, for us to provide data that's meaningful. I think it's also important for us to think about studies that really show, again, sort of causal impact. So I think that there's some new work that's been funded by SISIP and in other places where we can say, look, you know, we did have a, a quite big shock to the system in terms of additional funding going in quite rapidly through the Recovery Act uh, and some of the ARA spending. In other countries, there have been very big shifts in, in research funding allocation that have happened relatively quickly. And so I think we have a lot of opportunities to both study those things and then also to marshal that evidence. Because I think if we always go in and just say we want more for science and technology, you know, everybody has heard that, and of course we're going to say that. And so I think that coming in with evidence that says when you get these shifts, both in level and distribution, real things happen, real differences in outcomes happen. I think if we can marshal that evidence in a persuasive way, then I think we can be much more informed and are much more likely to be listened to. Okay. Uh, well, those are, are very good comments. I, uh, I worry a little bit about the Congress requiring a lot of evidence because, uh, as you know, many experiments don't come out that well. And uh, the Congress would say, you know, next time you come around, say, well, you know, you sold me on this project and nothing really good came out of it. And uh, that's, that's pretty hard to overcome. I, uh, I really appreciate the ideas you've, you've presented and the comments you've made today, and it's given me some new insight. But I really do think that uh, we need more concentration on this, not only in the Congress, but among the science policy community. And I pled several times earlier on about this was, I deliberately said unlocking the future because I wanted someone in the future to write better, something better about science policy and uh, something along the line of the Niebuhr Bush's book, which was probably thicker than we want today, but nevertheless, he addressed a lot of issues that, that had to be taken into account. He himself was very different, uh, very di concerned uh, about the fact that Congress did not pick up on a lot of his suggestions, and particularly one creating uh, a, a different version of the National Science Foundation, but yet out of his work and his arguments, eventually, I think, was it some 10 years after he wrote the book, we did start establishing the National Science Foundation. So even though he regarded his work as a failure because the Congress didn't pick up on it, yet eventually it did happen. So. Uh, I, I encourage uh, the science policy community to become very active and, frankly, also very aggressive in uh, addressing members of Congress. Uh, it would not hurt at all if uh, a few people from the science policy committee ran for Congress and got elected. And I just had an experience on the floor not 10, 15 minutes ago someone came up to me and had been present this morning at the science committee meeting and said, Vern, what in the world are we going to do without you? Because I had used my scientific knowledge in a number of statements. And I says, well, I think, you know, I don't think I do that much. Uh, they'll, they'll get along. But the matter of fact is uh, there won't be any scientists left on the science committee. And it's just helpful to be on the inside, all the side discussions that are held. It's good to have someone there. So I urge you to, as I've done with every speech I've given to every engineering or scientific group, run for Congress. We need more scientists in the Congress. And incidentally, not just for the benefit of science, but most scientists are fairly clear thinkers on issues, uh, frictionless or not and uh, they have a lot to contribute to the operation of the governing bodies of this country. I would actually say I probably got, had much more impact at the state level uh, because I was truly a rarity there and most state uh, governments don't have the resources to have scientists on staff. And I had endless amounts of work to do trying to resolve things 
such as uh, resolving difficulties between optom optometrists and ophthalmologists, or uh, dealing with questions such as the foam insulation that was the rage for a while, pumping it into homes, and now people are sick from formaldehyde fumes from that. Uh, these are issues no one in the in the state legislature was equipped to deal with, and I resented all the all the time I had to spend on it. But at the same time, uh, it was very useful to society. So spread the word, please, and thank you again for being here. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers. Mr. Chairman, I beg your pardon, but I, I have a bill on the floor that's just been called up, and I have to rush down there to speak on it. So uh, my apologies. Mr. Ehlers, b before you go, I just want to say on behalf of the uh, AAAS uh, science community and uh, the science SICIP community, we're going to miss you. <laughs> so thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, Dr. Ehlers, I, it, We'll assume I have your permission to, uh, to continue here and, and, and wrap up. Um, seeing as there was no objection from Dr. Ehlers, I, I, will, I was asking for your permission to continue on and to wrap up here. Thank you. Okay, you are, you are still here. And frictionless. Uh, I will now recognize myself for, for five minutes. Uh, I, it, it's funny the uh, talking about the assumptions and uh, comparing physics to uh, or, or, or trying to make political science in, in, into physics. I had a, a colleague of mine in uh, grad school in political science who uh, was also like myself had a background in engineering before going to get a PhD in political science and he always would say that uh, political science had physics envy, that we were trying to be physics. Now, it did not stop uh, political scientists uh, in even focusing specifically on Congress. Congressional scholars uh, did not, um, some of them were not afraid to make assumptions that uh, uh, wind up where they were talking about something that was supposed to be Congress but was pretty much, uh, very much uh, not Congress anymore after all the assumptions that were made and make all these assumptions that said with this, we're dealing with a imaginary legislature, but then we're gonna pretend like it's Congress. Uh, hopefully that's not the type of uh, work that's going on here in, in SICEP. I, I wanna make sure, well, one thing I wanted to ask, uh, Dr. Murray talked about this, and I wanna ask everyone about if they have any more comments on this, because I know Dr. Murray in your testimony, you uh, uh, talk extensively about it, is training uh, you know, more people to be able to, uh, to do this, this research in having programs that uh, uh, produce uh, the type of, you, know, you, you go into, especially talking about PhD programs, but do we need to, in general, produce people who can do this uh, to do this work, uh, and I know that that uh, people who are doing this research is in this field are located, as I mentioned in my opening statement, in all kinds of different places. Dr. Murray, I know you're in the uh, uh, business school. Uh, are there any suggestions? I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Dr. Murray or Dr. Tyke or Dr. Lane would want to say anything about where we are right now in terms of programs uh, that are producing uh, researchers uh, that can do SICIP, uh, where the, that is going, is, are there programs such as this that, that are out there? If not, where are they coming from? Is this something that we need to, you would think we need to do more of and concentrate on, uh, on such a specific field like this? Or can we get by with people coming from, from different fields? Is that, is that the the, the way to do it. So I just want to throw that question out there. As a, you know, former, uh, you know, political scientist, academic, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, questions like this in terms of what, what we're doing out there in higher education. So I think uh, that's a very uh, interesting question. It's an important question. Um, the main 
area, in, if you're going to train people in doing this kind of research, um, they're going to go into the field and, and do the kind, develop the kind of skill sets that we need. Uh, you want them to be able to get tenure, you want there to be able to be a career ladder. And a program the size of CISIP isn't sufficient to support a, uh, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary field in its own right. Uh, nor is it, I think, possible to develop career paths for such a narrow uh, set of skills. So I think what's important is to convince um, very smart people in economics and sociology in psychology and, and many of the other areas that the field of science policy is a really important and interesting field that they can bring their skill sets to bear on to answer important science policy questions and that they can publish and get um, uh, advance within their own disciplines. So I think that's what's critical, um, rather than trying to establish a, a separate field in its own right. I don't think that's feasible given budget constraints and so on. So that's what we've explicitly been trying to, to foster, uh, to make it a intellectually challenging, exciting, and publishable type of field. Any other comments, Dr. Murray? Yes, so I think it's. I think that there are three different constituencies for education. So one is the PhDs who are probably the producers of research. The other, and then there are the science and technology policy, ma typically master's students who tend to go into policy roles, who I think we need to educate to be both sort of consumers and also people who really understand what we do and can help do it with us. And then finally, there are probably the scientists and engineers themselves who could benefit from understanding some of this who then become a sort of bottom-up constituency who can shape agencies and so on. I think on the PhD side, I think Julia's exactly right. I don't think that you can have a new discipline of CISIP. I think it's both too small, and in fact, one of the great values of CISIP is indeed the fact that people come from these other strong disciplinary foundations. I think what we do need to emphasize, though, is serious, a sort of a field focus. If you think of a PhD in political science, economics, Mostly there's a field. At the moment, I don't think many places really have a field focus and something that we would recognize as CISIP. And I think that we could go a long way towards uh, funding things that would help establish that. Um, you know, PhD education requires, especially in something like this, you know, significant investment in teaching materials and data sets and things so that students can, can work on this and that we could effectively collaborate across a set of schools to really be begin to develop materials, share expertise, and then potentially bring the PhD students together as a community so that they recognize one another, even though they're always going home and we know we're educating them to be hired by business schools, economics departments, and so on. So I, I think that there's an opportunity there as long as we make sure we know what we're trying to accomplish, which is not a new discipline. I think on the science and technology master's side, I'm less familiar with that because even though I do CISIP research, I don't teach in the technology and policy program at MIT, but that in and of itself tells you something, <laughs> which is that um, there's, I think, a little bit of, still of a disconnect that the traditional science and technology policy programs have not necessarily sort of incorporated CISIP research into their uh, teaching material. And so, I, again, I think that there's an opportunity to do something about that, not to insist that people do it, but to provide opportunities to develop a really effective curriculum so that as people go into different, into their careers as policymakers, they understand what we're trying to do, some of the methods, they know good CISIT research from less good CISIT research, and they themselves can say, oh, you know, we're doing something in our agency. We could actually run that as an experiment that could be studied. We could try two different ways of allocating funding, and we could really do the analysis with real data. And I think if we could educate people to that level, we'd have a much better interchange in the long run, and uh, it, would be a really, it would be a very vibrant community. You and Dr. Tyke? Yes, well, a couple of uh, things uh, worth noting in response. First of all, there are uh, and have existed for some time about 25 programs in uh, universities around the uh, United States and some outside the U.S. in addition to those 25 that provide graduate education in science, what we called have called science engineering and public policy, um, and which overlaps quite substantially with what we now call SCI-SIP. Um, we had, uh, many years ago, we published a, a, um, a, a guide, um, 
old-fashioned paper type gu guide. Uh, we now have a, um, uh, a website on the AAAS website that links to all of these programs which could help people find uh, them. Uh, I don't see this uh, as a discipline either, uh, as was uh, said a moment ago. It's a, um, my, my analogy is that, is that uh, it's more like a, a field of, uh, of, say, area studies in which, it's like Latin American studies, for example, or African studies. It is a field in which many different disciplines contribute to an understanding of what's going on in this, uh, uh, in this business. So uh, that, that, that's one thing that uh, I, I wanted to mention. Another thing is that there, is, there are a lot of young people who are very interested in this, and we need to encourage them. Uh, there is an organization called International Nonprofit, it's incorporated as a 501c3, um, called Triple Helix Incorporated, which has about 500 students from uh, many uh, universities, prestigious universities around the world, uh, which provides an opportunity for students to educate themselves about the relationships between science and society and ethics, business and, and law. Uh, they actually publish an undergraduate uh, journal, uh, which AAAS, a couple of people from AAAS's staff serve on their board of advisors. Um, they also uh, have a poster session at the AAAS annual meeting. And then there's a group called the Science and Technology, or s and Global Consortium, which is an association of graduate students and, and these programs that I mentioned, uh, which uh, also brings together people. They have a, a conference uh, usually here in Washington in collaboration between AAAS and the National Academies, provide an opportunity for younger people to explore this field, get into it if they're interested, and some of them some of them do. We at AAAS have, have um, hired on our staff several people who've been graduates of this program, master's degree graduates from this program, and some have been highly successful and uh, are, uh, are really leaders, young leaders in the field. Uh, so I'm, uh, I, I'm an advocate for this kind of education, and I think uh, we're doing it, and I think it would be useful for uh, Congress, for members of Congress, if they were aware of this, to provide, uh, I would say, moral support by speaking at their meetings and uh, staff, having staff attend and so on. So I'm, uh, uh, I'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you, Dr. Tyke. And I, I had a, um, when we were going out for votes, uh, I was getting in an elevator and someone who had been sitting in the audience uh, came up and thanked me for having this, uh, the hearing on SISIP and said, how do members really become educated? How do you have the time? Um, and I said it's very, very difficult and what it really takes is a dedication to you know, being educated uh, because uh, the, um, the, the incentives other than really wanting to do a good job and being interested in this topic aren't, uh, aren't there. Uh, it's unfortunate, but the good thing is that we do have staff who are well educated in uh, in these things, and uh, uh, it leads me into thanking the staff for all their work that uh, that you do, and all, all the staff on the science committee does an excellent job, so that we helps us to do a better job here, hopefully, on the uh, science and technology committee, help the members do a better job. So, I thank the thank the staff for all the work. That, uh, that they do. Uh, with that, I want to thank the uh, witnesses for their testimony. Uh, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. With that, the witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned.